Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending my talk. I really appreciate that. And today I have the pleasure to present to you my work on how to steal and defend machine learning models. Nowadays, machine learning APIs offer a broad range of services. Thanks to Google services, we can easily translate a given text to, uh, for example, uh, German. And uh, this works for any kind of uh, documents, web pages, and at one single click, in the speed of a second, we can have this uh, very useful translation. OpenAI exposes its GPT-3 model that performs many NLP tasks, such as uh, text generation. For example, you can use GPT-3, recite the first law of robotics, or even generate a poem. It is really fun to play with the GPT-3 model. It generates useful content, like beautiful birthday wishes, but it's also sometimes even scary how good it is at these tasks. OpenAI's codec system translates natural language to code. You can type a comment in the text box on the left-hand side and then see the corresponding code on the right-hand side. Cladify went even a step further. They catered uh, to many uh, needs of ML models and the, the creators to create a platform where other companies can deploy ML models in the pay-as-you-query setting. This platform exposes models for vision, NLP, and many other domains. Machine learning APIs become a dominant paradigm for using ML models. Behind the scenes, the, to create such ML APIs, especially models behind such APIs, it's a costly venture. There are four main factors that contribute to this high cost. First, it is hard to collect and label data, especially in the case of the financial or medical domains. In case of labeling, we have to, for example, uh, for labeling 1 million images, we have to pay more than $170,000 using mechanical Turk from Amazon. And this is only if we assume that we rely on a single label per image. If we want to have more reliable labeling of our data, we probably need uh, five of these labels per image. So this cost grows to over $1 million. Next, we also need to hire ML experts to tune parameters, hyperparameters of the models. And finally, we also need expensive hardware such as GPUs, TPUs, or many CPUs for training and inference. Also, we have to account for, for example, many failed runs. And uh, finally, that um, these models might be deployed in uh, many, for many services. So, for example, it was reported that a single training run of the GPT-3 model cost north of $12 million. However, the querying party will be malicious with the goal of extracting the model behind the ML API. In 2020, Microsoft published a survey where they analyzed 28 businesses uh, from the US and ranked model stealing among one of the most severe attacks against machine learning. The the threat of stealing machine learning models is real. Recently, researchers from CISPA here, headed by uh, Yang Zhang, showed that training ResNet 50 SSL model costs uh, more than $5,730, whereas stealing such an encoder costs only $72. So adversaries' main incentive is to steal a model at a much lower cost than training this model from scratch. So now, taking into account how versatile and useful these uh, ML services are, and how important the problem of protecting them is, the overarching goal of my research is to create secure and trustworthy machine learning as a service. The first objective is to protect models from being stolen, hence providing model confidentiality. Second aspect is that I want to protect the privacy of the data on which the models were trained. And finally, we also need to provide good service, so expose robust models. So that API can be uh, robust against, for example, some noisy inputs and refrain from answering queries that are out of distribution. So to achieve this goal of model confidentiality, I work on uh, this research that uh, first focuses on uh, how to create novel proactive defenses that increase the cost of model extraction with, in this case, calibrated proof of work. I also introduced new stealing attacks and defenses for self-supervised models. At the end of my talk, I will also give overview of other aspects of my research, 
I'll talk about data privacy, especially in the context of collaborative learning. And I will also explain more how we can create more, more robust models um, for the ML APIs. So first I will focus on my real most recent work, most, most recent work on model stealing and defenses. So let's start from the beginning. How do we use this machine learning APIs? Imagine that you have this uh, image and you send this image as a query to ML API. ML API runs this image uh, for the model, we do this inference and then return the answer, which is in this case level of a dog. So this is very simple. And then the querying party might be malicious. And uh, here the querying party collects some uh, unlabeled uh, data and uh, then sends these data items as queries to the ML API and then victim model response with some low dimensional output such as labels, softmax scores or logics. And now, based on this pairs of unlabeled data items and predicted labels by the victim model, adversary can create a stolen version of the victim model. So what are the assumptions? It is enough to have unlabeled data that come from even different distribution than distribution of the training data for the victim model. And it was shown that, for example, if the victim model was trained on C410 data, you can query this model to extract this model, for example, in internet data. Further on, we don't have to have to know what is the exact model architecture of the victim of the victim. It can be, for example, our stolen copy with the same family of architectures, or even, for example, if victim model is CNN, we also can have CNN as our stolen uh, code. It doesn't have to be the same exact architecture as the, as the victim model. Moreover, what is happening currently is that many of these uh, APIs, for example, Clarify AI, they expose metadata about the models. For example, you can find that a given model was a resident architecture, which was trained on ImageNet, ImageNet 21K, open images, and other data sets. And uh, these APIs that reveal such information, they do that to provide more trust and transparency for the users so that these users can be uh, certain about what kind of um, service to expect from a given API. And now, knowing how easy it is to steal the models, let's discuss what are possible defenses against model stealing. So current defenses against model stealing can, can be broadly categorized into two classes based on when they, are, when they are applied. So active defenses act as the stealing process is happening and aim at differ, deferring an adversary from stealing. Examples of such defenses can, uh, for example, perturb the outputs from the model, truncate the outputs in some way to make this um, training of the stolen copy more difficult for the adversary. So they call it officially to poison the objective of the adversary. And the uh, other category of uh, model defenses are ownership resolutions. So these methods are applied after the attack has happened to detect a stolen model. Examples of such defenses include watermarking, which uh, embeds some uh, specific, for example, task or uh, uh, additional additional uh, information into the model during training. And then if analyzed uh, as suspect model also contains this watermark, then we can mark such model as being stolen. So first let's talk about active defenses. So current active defenses perturb the output to poison the training objective of the attacker. So this means that the perturbed outputs make the training of the stolen copy much more difficult. At the same time, these defenses lower the quality of the output for legitimate users. So these defenses exchange higher robustness against model stealing for lower quality of outputs for legitimate users. So I looked at this problem from different perspectives, and I proposed a new active defense which can also be called proactive, that increases the cost of stealing attack. So the reason why models are stolen is that price of stealing the model is much lower than creating this model from scratch. Thus, if we increase the attack cost, then there is no incentive for the, for the attacker to steal this model. So in principle, what's happening here is that I ship the trade-off from model robustness to lower accuracy the trade-off between 
higher robustness of the model against stealing attacks for higher cost of extracting the model from an uh, ML API. So in our defense, we can also replace this uh, additional work uh, done by uh, querying user with, for example, additional elapsed time that has to be uh, gone for this given user. Also, user has to, for example, increase uh, the disk space usage or simply have to pay more for our queries. And then our defense also works for different types of outputs. So perturbation-based defenses, they perturb these uh, softmax outputs. Sometimes they can preserve, for example, the argmax, and they assume that uh, adversary should uh, train the stolen copy on the softmax outputs. However, in uh, our defense, we don't make any such assumptions. For us, any kind of output from a given model is uh, valid, and still our defense works, even if, for example, our model has to return labels without any additional information, such as probabilities per class. So now, once we know that we have to increase the cost of model extraction, we have to also know to which of these queries for which users we should do that. So the main insight in my method is on how to distinguish between benign versus malicious users. So each user sends some queries to ML API, and then we have to decide which of these users should be really um, penalized more for queries that extract more information from our model. So what we do is really that we want to detect malicious users, or malicious, malicious queries, and estimate information leakage for each uh, of these queries. So by the definition, adversary wants to extract as much information from our model as possible, because then the faster the stealing process. So users who incur much more information from the API than legitimate users through their queries, they pay more for access to the API. And we do that by estimating exactly how much information leakage a given query incurs from our model. So let me delve deeper into our defense. So first, I will present an overview of my defense, and then we will zoom in on the individual components. So let me, let me formalize more our defense. In our proactive defense, the first step is to estimate the information leakage the client's queries incur from the victim model. The goal is to set higher costs for queries that incur more information from the model versus queries that incur less information from our one. So we start from attacker sending these enabled data items as queries to the victim model. And for this estimation of the information leakage, we use uh, different tools, for example, from information theory, such as entropy metric, as well as tools from differential privacy, such as Pate framework. And I will discuss more these uh, uh, concepts very soon in the next uh, one of the next slides. So once we estimate information leakage, we can generate a puzzle whose difficulty depends on how much information a given query incurs. To generate the puzzle, we use also different tools. One of them is based on proof of work. I will also explain that very soon. Next, a user or an attacker has to solve the puzzle and send the solution back to the server. So this step increases the cost of model stealing. The server verifies the solution, and if the solution is correct, then the uh, answering party, in case, this case our victim model, returns outputs back to the uh, querying party. So now we know what is the overview of our defense, that the users have to solve the puzzle and this increases the cost of model extraction. And now let's focus on some details. So let's first analyze and zoom in on how to estimate information leakage from a given model. So let's imagine that we have this victim model parameters theta, and uh, we query the model with some image of a cat, and uh, the model output probability is per label. So how probable a given label is in the input. So the highest probability is assigned to the label of a cat. The second highest probability is assigned to the label of a tiger. So with that, we are able to, uh, in, to estimate information leakage from the model using the, for example, margin metric, where the cost is equal to one minus a gap. And, and the gap is between probability of the most probable class, in this case, class number two with a cat, and the probability of the second most probable class, which is class number four of a type. 
So intuitively, if the gap is large, this means that the model is confident about the prediction and the margin leakage is low. On the other hand, if the gap is small, so the model is not confident about the input, uh, input uh, query response, then such an example is probably close to a decision boundaries between, for example, two classes, an adversary might learn more about our model, especially decision boundaries. So for this kind of uh, cases, the margin leakage is higher. We also use uh, other metrics, for example, standard entropy metric, where Y sub I ranges over all possible classes. So the higher entropy of the softmax scores, the higher the information leakage from the model. And uh, finally, we also use metrics that are based on the privacy leakage, which is proportional to the probability that the noisy output that uh, our privacy mechanisms return, uh, that these outputs are different from the predicted label, the correct class, in this case, class number two. So we use the privacy cost estimator from uh, Pate. And to measure the privacy leakage, we use tools, we use also other tools from uh, the privacy, especially the tools that are based on the Pate framework. And in our research, we find that tracking this privacy leakage and using tools from differential privacy gives us the best, meaning the most uh, accurate estimation of information leakage from a given model. Okay, so we have this uh, metrics, and now we know how to estimate information leakage from a given query, for a given query from our victim model. So now, once we have that, we want to generate puzzle. So the duration of the puzzle uh, in our defense uh, starts from sending challenge string S to a client. So in this case, our challenge string, string S is uh, um, string SISPA. So uh, this challenge string S is sent to the client and the client has to really brute force search for the suffix X such that if we append this suffix X to the challenge string S, and taking the binary hash cache of binary binary hash of this uh, whole as and with pendant x, then we have as output in binary form um, specific number of leading zeros that are required in the puzzle. So in our puzzle, for example, we can specify that the binary hash should return output that has twenty leading zeros. And then this is the solution to our puzzle. So if you run this in reality, so this is not a fake example, it really works, then this uh, this uh, binary string is indeed the, the puzzle, puzzle solution based on the fact that you can find this suffix x, and this is the correct suffix x. So in our um, algorithm, we don't use a standard hash cache, which is based on hexadecimal numbers, but we use binary hash cache because we want to have fine-grained con control over how much computation cost a given user has to spend depending on how many reading zeros are required in the puzzle solution. So here we present this result and on the x-axis we have number of reading zeros that are required in the puzzle um, solution versus on the y-axis computation time that it takes for a user in seconds to find the solution to the puzzle. So we can see that with more reading zeros this um, computation time uh, requirement uh, grows exponentially. And uh, with, uh, with that, we are able to also control how much really we want a given user to spend computation to solve a given puzzle, depending on the difficulty of the, of the, of the puzzle that we set at the beginning. So now, once we have that, what we do is that first we, first we, uh, first we uh, estimate what is information leakage uh, from our victim model for legitimate users? So here we analyze many different users. They usually query our model with uh, random queries, meaning that queries are not in a specific order. They also usually query our model from data that comes from smear distribution to what we use for training our model. And uh, then this serves as our reference cost. Next step is that we want to measure what is information leakage for other users? And what we observed is that with standard model stealing attacks, such as Jacobian-based attack, copycat, data-free model extraction, all of them, they incur higher information leakage than legitimate users. So then 
our final uh, calibration of the positive difficulty is to map information leakage, a given, a given uh, query in cares for the positive difficulty. And uh, in general, the higher the privacy deviation of a given user, the higher information leakage, the more difficult puzzle is sent to the user. Okay, so the question is, how does our defense perform? In this graph, we show on the x-axis query time that uh, takes to um, query this API. And on the y-axis, we present accuracy that you can achieve if you train your model, stolen copy on the, uh, on the queries and the uh, pseudo label that were provided by the victim model. To run this experiment, we had to create the SAML API and we simulate how exactly this would happen in reality. So what happens if uh, users query our API, 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 how long it takes for them to query the API, how long it takes for attackers to query the API, and we check how our defense performs for these different cases. And here, note actually that the query time on the x-axis is in the log scale. So here, the dashed line, uh, the blue dash line in this case represents the legitimate user. So user who queries the model with random order of queries, the queries come from good distribution, the same as a uh, training set. And uh, then if we apply our defense, this is the dashed line, then you observe that the difference between these two cases is very small. It's maximum 2x, which means that we don't, um, we don't uh, uh, like apply more overhead for a given legitimate user. So the overhead is really negligible. And then we check what's happening if we have an attacker who carries our ML API. So this is for, a, for example, copycat attack. And uh, the increase in the query time for this attack is 100x, which means that the attacker really at the end has no incentive to query our model because really training this uh, model from scratch on uh, his or her end is basically the same cost uh, as uh, stealing from uh, this API, which is protected by our defense. So up to now, we have analyzed the supervised learning APIs. And to recap this part, I showed that my novel defense is the first proactive approach, which increases the cost of model extraction, but does not lower the quality of output for legitimate users. So this is uh, very, I would say, State of the art, and this gives us very good uh, um, protection against against supervised learning APIs. However, nowadays uh, there are new paradigms, especially self supervised learning APIs. And uh, in this uh, setting, we train a model which is called encoder on unlabeled data, and this is much different than supervised learning, where we have to label the data before training. Idea for the supervised learning is that uh, for a given query, these supervised learning models, which we call encoders, they return high dimensional representations, which are feature vectors. So these models are not returning single label, but gives you very useful embeddings, representations, that are basically features extracted from your query. And then you can use these representations to train plethora of downstream tasks. You can, for example, take these presentations, fine tune this model, or add some additional layer on top of that, and then have, for example, classification, segmentation, many different tasks just from this single representation that extracts good features for your input. So there was really a shift of paradigm for uh, ML to go to the supervised models. And uh, I found out that current defenses against uh, supervised models are not easily retrofitted to this uh, new paradigm of self-supervised learning. So I will show you how we can extract encoders and also detect if a given encoder is a stolen copy of our victim. So let me delve deeper into, first of all, how to steal these models. So nowadays, mm, there are many new uh, papers, even one from CISPA about how to steal that, so the, the self-supervised encoders. So first thing is that we want to use data augmentations because in principle, how these encoders work that they want to give you good representations for a given image to really extract its meaning. So even if you augment your given image with different augmentations many times, all of these augmented versions of the same image 
they should return you the same representation. So uh, we will uh, use this principle for uh, for uh, our attacks. So we, we can augment data in different ways, right? We can, for example, have input image of this dog. We can have like grayscale augmentations. We can flip the image horizontally. You can flip image vertically. So all of that is just to preserve uh, uh, content of the image in terms of the uh, meaning, in terms of the uh, like what this what this image represents, but with uh, different uh, different forms. And then in our attack, we set up Siamis networks. So what we do is that uh, we have this uh, uh, stellar encoder. It serves in our Siamis network as one one leg of this uh, of this setup. And then we want to imitate this victim encoder with our stolen copy that we train during stealing. And uh, this works as Siamis uh, networks. And uh, this uh, uh, stolen copy learns from the victim that acts as a additional uh, like this other, let's say, teacher. This network teaches us how to train our stolen copy. And finally, what we also find out is that uh, contrastive loss functions, they work much better for both for training these encoders, as well as for stealing them. And I will explain very soon how they work. So let me start from that. We have this input query, this image of a dog, and then we do two augmentations of the same image. For example, in this case, we do horizontal flip for the first augmentation. Second augmentation is that we apply grade scale augmentation. And then we pass this uh, first augmentation through a victim encoder. So this augmented version gives us some representation y sub one. And then second augmentation uh, is uh, passed through the stellar encoder. And this is during our training of this uh, of the stellar encoder. And this second augmented version gives us representation y sub two. What we really want is that uh, these uh, representations that are out from the victim encoder y sub one and from the stolen encoder, Y sub 2, that they match. They're close to each other in the representation space. So here, what we do, we apply different loss functions to achieve that. So let me focus on specific loss functions that we use for training of these encoders, as well as for stealing them, which are contrastive loss functions. So at the beginning, before we steal our model, in the representation space, the victim's representations, in this case, Y sub 1, is far away from the representation for the stolen copy, which is y sub two. What we really want that after the training, after stealing of this stolen encoder, the representations for the victim and stolen copy, they should be close to each other. So we want them to be attracted to each other so that our stolen copy works the same way as the victim. But this is not the end of the story because what we also want for these models to have really meaningful representations. So if you have representations of a cat, it should be far from the representations of the, of the dog. So in this first, first dog image, and it has the representation y sub one, but representations from a, for a cat, y sub three should be far away from the representation of the dog, obviously. And then also we want to repair representations from the cat, from this, from the dog, for our stolen copy. So then we can have this good encoder that uh, separates these uh, different concepts far from each other and puts together close to each other, like uh, clusters, similar representations that come from the same uh, kind of inputs. OK. And now let's use this uh, main property of encoder. So what is this? Again, if you have input image uh, of a dog, and then it gives representation y sub 1, this encoder, right? Then if you augment this image of a dog with many versions of augmentations, then all of them should return the same representation because we care about meaning of this input image and don't, don't care about the form augmentation of the given of the given content. So in principle, we don't have to query the victim encoder many times for all the all segmentations. You can query the victim encoder once with one of these uh, versions of augmented uh, images. So we query the victim once, but then we also use many augmentations for our stolen copy. So we want our stolen copy to use all of the segmentations. And for all of them, provide very similar representation in the, in ideal case the same as victim provided for this single uh, single copy of the of the uh, input image. So with that, if we query 
predictive ones and then use many implementations for our restaurant copy to train it very well, then because of this property of encoders, we can we can reuse the representations for the single image for all of the augmentations. And then what's happening is that attacker needs much fewer queries to query the encoder uh, than in case, for example, supervised uh, learning. So this uh, saves us a lot in terms of uh, how we can really steal the models. Okay, so now let's analyze what is the impact of the loss functions on encoder stealing. So the selection of the loss functions is one of the most important parameters for stealing encoders. So we compared uh, standard loss functions as well as modern batch uh, contrastive losses. And the standard losses like mean squared error, they are used to directly minimize distances between representations from the victim and stolen copy. Modern batch contrastive loss functions such as of nearest neighbors, influence silos, and so on, they compare not only positive pairs, as we explained, but also negative pairs. And here we see that they're able to extract images and extract, extract this uh, model, victim model, in this case, image net encoder, with much higher quality of the stolen copy than using these standard loss functions like mean squared error. So the first, uh, first conclusion from these experiments is that contrastive loss functions perform much better for both training of the encoders as well as for stealing them. Second aspect is that in these experiments, number of queries is really limited. So we used number of queries for stealing, that is one fifth of the number of training data points for the victim encoder, which in this case was image So what we did in the experiment is was that victim was trained on 1.4 million images from ImageNet, and we are able to steal this using less than 250,000 uh, uh, queries. So much fewer queries than training this, uh, this victim from scratch. Okay. So we have been, having discussed how to steal encoders, let us now consider defense methods. Active defenses for encoders also are there either perturb or truncate uh, the answers to poison the training objective of the attacker, but they were shown to uh, be not usable. So because they harm substantially the performance of the legitimate users. So really what's happening here is that uh, these uh, encoders with active defenses, they return representations that are, for example, quantized in some way compressed. Also was proposed, for example, to add some noise to these representations. Indeed, if you do these uh, um, like augmentations of these uh, representations in this case, then you can make sure that the quality of the representations is, is lower and stolen copies also have lower quality. However, this substantially also lowers quality of the uh, legitimate users. And if they want to use the representations, their downstream tasks are of much lower performance. So these defenses, active defenses, are currently not applicable. They are not usable. So what we can do in this situation? So we proposed to focus first on how to detect if a given color is stolen. And the first defense that can be applied in this setting is to, uh, for example, use watermarking. So watermarking-based defenses embed, embed a unique task into the encoder, which marks the encoder as, a, as our property. If we can prove that this property is also, if, if our unique property, uh, of some maybe even timestamp, is present in a, uh, in a stolen copy, then indeed we can claim that our recorder was stolen. So let me show you one of these examples how we can apply watermarking for encoders. So in our case, what we are doing is that uh, we are uh, first, considering this standard training of encoders, we have some input images. Through the training of the encoders, we want to generate some useful representations. So this is the general task. And then the next is that during training of the encoders, we also add additional task that, that acts as a watermark. So what, what, what do we do is that for these input images, we also rotate them by some angle, run them through the encoder, we add on top of the presentations additional layer, then then can classify what's the rotation range of a given image. 
So rotation range is um, classification, which is binary one. We want to classify the range of the image to be from 0 to 180 or 180 to 360 degrees. And uh, such uh, such uh, property that we are able to classify correctly this rotation range is present in the watermark encoder, so our victim that we want to defend, as well as the land copy, because this transfers relatively well. Here we present how this binary task transfers from our victim to the stolen copy during uh, the extraction process. So by transferability, I mean that this, ta this task of classifying correctly rotation range is uh, really performing well in our victim as well as in the stolen copy. So here we present on the y-axis watermark defense success rate in, uh, in this percentage score for accuracy of this binary classification. Um, as the function of the number, number of queries used for the streaming of a given victim encoder. So here we present uh, at the bottom of this graph, this dashed black line, what is the watermark defense success rate in percentage for legitimate users? It's 50%, so it's random. Because it's a binary task, that means that this legitimate user who trained the model differently than the streaming from our, our victim is really uh, uh, not performing in any way good on this task. So we can we can mark such a color as being legitimate, not stolen, right? And then what we see is that the more queries are used by the adversary to steal our encoder, so the more um, higher, the, the higher the quality of the stolen encoder is, the higher is also the watermark defense success rate, which means that the watermark is, uh, is uh, copied to the stolen copy uh, during the stealing process, and the better the stolen copy, the better is the performance of this binary task on this um, stolen encoder. This is all good. However, there are some disadvantages of watermarking in the color. So first of all, watermarking requires us to either train this model during and uh, during the training process of the encoder with the additional task, which is watermark task. However, what about if somebody already has some, some pre-trained encoder and they, they don't want to train from scratch because usually it is a costly process. So we can also fine tune the encoders. However, again, these are big models, so it might take really uh, non-negligible time. And so there is some, uh, some requirement to change the model. Second is that uh, there are different ways how adversaries might extract these uh, stolen copies from victims. And uh, with these different extraction methods, they might really try to lower the transferability of the watermark from the victim encoder. And uh, finally, what we also can observe is that adversaries who are especially adaptive after a streaming encoder, they might also obfuscate the representations from their stolen copy. So in this case, we also rely with our defense on the fact that we add a small layer on top of the representations. So if someone obfuscates the representations, then they might, for example, avoid detection by this watermarking uh, uh, verification process. And uh, here, one of the possible obfuscations is that, for example, adversary changes the order of elements in the representations. So, for example, element first in the original representation is moved to the last element in the representation. So, such obfuscations do not really harm performance or downstream tasks. So, if you change order of these uh, elements representations, it doesn't really doesn't really influence in any way in the the power of the representations, the representative power, right? And uh, now, with all of that, of course, we can also try other methods how to remove the watermark, for example, for some using some compression of the neural network and so on and so forth. So there are all of these drawbacks to watermarking. And uh, we wanted to tackle these problems with watermarking and proposed a new method to detect stolen encoders. So our approach is based on this inference that treats the training data of the victim encoder as being the signature for this encoder. What it means is that uh, we we treat our data that we use for training as unique. Like it's very not probable that somebody uses the same exact data set for training as we do. And the uh, detection method is effective and does not require any encoder fine tuning. So let me delve deeper into 
how this uh, how this uh, uh, detection method works. So for the resolution of the ownership, we assume that uh, we, as a defender, have access to our training and test sets that come from the same distribution, as well as the query access to the suspect encoder. The first step is to train a meta model, which in this case is Gaussian mixture model. And uh, this is really done to estimate density of the representation, basically to model the interdistribution. And uh, here for this, we use part of the training set. We run this through the encoder to get representations. And then for representations, we can train this uh, a meta model. The second step is we take other part of the training set and also our tests that come from the same distribution. Again, we run them through the suspect encoder, it generates representations. We use them to as inputs for this Gaussian mixture model. And then this model gives us log likelihoods of uh, this representation. So how probable a given representation is uh, for a given encoder. So what we see is this, that if this log likelihood actually is higher for the training set, and for the test set, then we mark such an encoder as being stolen. What is what is intuition behind this uh, verification process? So ultimately, if a given model sees the training data during during the training process, then the model acts behaves differently on the training data than on the test data. So this model, if it's for example suspect encoder, if it saw these uh, training data points either either directly, somebody stole our data set, or indirectly through querying the victim encoder, then this model behaves differently, has probably, in this case, has higher hollow likelihood for these representations than for the test data points that were not seen during training. Otherwise, if there is almost no difference between the log likelihoods for the training set versus test set, then we mark such encoder as being independent, meaning not stolen. So now let's uh, let's delve deeper into how we really run this uh, whole procedure. In our work, we use an arbitrator. So the advantage of this arbitrator is that uh, instead of querying the potentially stolen encoder uh, and the victim, for example, has their own private uh, training set, if we if we query this private training set uh, suspect encoder then we might reveal our, our private training set to potential attacker. Attacker might take the data points and say, I also have these data points and uh, I trained my encoder on these samples as well. So it doesn't really work in this way to verify ownership. So we assume that there is this fair trusted party that uh, can um, take our data points and won't reveal them to anybody. And then other thing is that they also they should have access to this suspect encoder. In this case, for example, they can take this encoder um, and uh, then run on their own this inference on this encoder and having only querying access, black box even access to this query encoder. Uh, but without revealing our private training data to potential attacker. Okay, so for our um, for our Final verification process, we use statistical tests to uh, verify suspect encoder. And we use statistical test, which is in this case t-test. We set our hypothesis to be that there is no difference between distributions of the training set and the test set. And uh, then we set the threshold uh, p-value for, uh, for our test. If the p-value is below 5%, then it denotes the stolen uh, this is stolen encoder or a victim encoder. Otherwise, if the t-test is inconclusive, encoder, encoder is marked as being independent, meaning not stolen. Let's look into the results. So here we present empirical evaluation. We observe that our test correctly assigns the p-values below the threshold of 5% for a stolen encoder, while the independent encoder has a p-value 10 times higher than the threshold of 5%. So um, in this case, we correctly classify stolen versus independent, not stolen encoders. 
Next, next step that attackers adapt. And uh, here, arbitrator to perform ownership resolution takes into account the presentations from, uh, from the training versus test set using the given uh, suspect encoder. And uh, we can apply the same technique like in watermarking to basically obfuscate the representations and fool the arbitrator. So um, how it can happen is that, okay, one of these uh, potential obfuscations is that we shuffle elements, so change their order. For example, the first element in the representation goes as the second one, second one as the first, and so on and so forth. So we just shuffle the elements in the representations. We can also, for example, add some constant values to like within the representations, or even pad these representations with some, let's say, zeros or other constant values. Another aspect is that we can also, for example, apply some affine transformation representation. So if, let's say we can multiply every element in representation by two, add some constant to these elements, it can be just even some near transformation. And then the interesting aspect is that all of the representations, uh, even after transformations, they preserve the quality of output, so they perform uh, very well on downstream tasks. However, they uh, might, for example, fool our, for our detection methods. And what we see is that despite all of these obfuscations, our method assigns uh, p-values for these seven encoders that are below the threshold of 5%. Thus, this implies that our method is robust to such obfuscations. And again, our method always returns uh, um, uh, above the 5% threshold values for independent uniqueness for the encoder. So the, it has very uh, low probability of having false positives. Okay, so let me summarize the main part of the talk on the stealing attacks and defenses. So recent attacks on ML models show that highly high quality models or encoders can be extracted at the fraction of the cost of creating the victim encoder or model. And these models can also be used for further attacks, uh, such as reconnaissance, prior to mounting uh, other, other, for example, um, possible attacks, such as adversarial examples. Our work shows that we can design active defenses against stealing supervised models without lowering quality of output for legitimate users. So we propose a novel proactive defense, which makes model extraction more difficult by requiring users to complete a calibrated proof of work before they can read the predictions from our model. And here, the main contribution was that we changed the, we changed the uh, trade-off from uh, higher robustness uh, traded for lower quality of outputs for all users. We changed this trade-off to the trade-off between higher robustness of models against stealing for higher cost for users to query the API. And this cost is uh, calibrated, so legitimate users are not really harmed, they are they have negligible overhead. However, attackers have much much higher cost of stealing the models. So this this and this incentivize them to steal the encoder. Next, we also showed that uh, it is uh, easy to steal self-supervised models, meaning encoders. However, it is uh, much more difficult to defend them against stealing. And uh, we proposed a few methods, how to detect them. One of the best ones currently is that we can uh, apply a method that uh, treats the training set of the encoder as being its private signature. And then if somebody steals this encoder, then also steal knowledge from this data set. And uh, naturally, this, this signature transfers to the stolen copy. So the dataset inference is uh, our current uh, uh, method to detect self-supervised models. And uh, finally, what we observe is that uh, neither of these active uh, defenses currently is applicable out of the box to encoders. And uh, there is uh, an urgent need to provide uh, active or proactive defenses against encoder stealing. But again, what we really want to achieve here is this, that uh, we want to really increase the cost of encoder extraction in this case, again, without um, lowering quality of representations. So we don't want this situation as in the current active defenses that they 
lower quality of storage encoders at the, at the high cost of lowering quality of presentations for legitimate users. So indeed, like, this, is one, this is one of the problems that is very, very close to my heart. It's open problem, how to design active defenses against encoder stealing. Okay, so now let's uh, go back to this uh, agenda. So apart from uh, this aspect of how to steal and defend encoders or models, I also work on data privacy, especially in the context of collaborative learning. So we need to do that because we also want to provide that this, this uh, private data for uh, this API. So if, if a given service provider has user's data and they train on this user's data, we don't want this user data to be, to be leaked from the model exposed by public API. So here, let's imagine that there is a doctor that uh, has a new patient. And uh, the doctor takes chest x-ray of this patient and the doctor is not certain about his or her diagnosis. So the doctor would like to privately consult other hospitals or doctors in case of this um, difficult diagnosis. So what we, what we call it is that the doctor would like to have second opinion on a difficult diagnosis. So the doctor sends this chest x-ray to these other collaborating parties, other hospitals or doctors. The doctors can run inference on their private models using this new input. Then we aggregate their answers into a single answer that's returned back to the querying dot. So ultimately what we want to achieve here is private consultation for doctors. However, there are two issues with uh, this setup. First one is that we don't want uh, the liability for these other collaborating parties to be responsible for these new data items, to manage that, to, uh, to keep it private and so on. The second, we also would have to ask this new patient to sign as documents to allow to send this data in a plain form to all our other collaborating parties, but it's a lot of paperwork and we want to really avoid it. So how can we protect confidentiality of this uh, user's data? So here we use uh, tools from cryptography, especially homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation. So what do we do is that we encrypt the query and then we send this encrypted query, query to collaborating parties. Collaborating parties, they do private inference on this encrypted query. And then only the final user who queries these uh, other collaborating parties can read the output and encrypt that. So for the whole inference process, Nobody can see this new patient's data apart from the doctor who admits this patient. Then another aspect and here is that we don't want these other parties who train their model on some private data. We don't want them to reveal anything about the private data to the querying part. So this is the opposite direction. And uh, for that, we use tools from differential privacy, such as Pate to privately aggregate these answers from other parties and then return noisy answers to the querying part. Noisy in the sense that the querying party should not be able to infer anything about the other users in the collaboration, other users uh, data. Okay, so then for the APIs, what we want to also do is to expose robust models. So how can we do that? So first of all, these outputs that users uh, can provide to our uh, ML APIs can be, for example, noisy. They can have some natural noise added because of like uh, low quality of devices, or they also can add some natural noise. They can also provide examples for other distribution that we didn't expect. Also examples that are difficult to classify, for example, because these are like corner cases. So all of these uh, all of these problems uh, emerge naturally in uh, in uh, for example industries such as hospitals or, uh, or banks, and uh, then what should happen in this situation is that we either detect that a given example is for example adversarial, on or it has really out of is out of distribution, or has some noise, and then we can reject such query and basically refrain from answering such queries uh, for these users. However, it also can happen that our models can generalize to these, uh, these for the noisy examples. So how we can generalize? So I, I did fundamental work on analysis of neural network in the Fourier domain. So here, 
we can see on the left hand side image in the spatial domain and then after Fourier transformation is the same image on the left hand side by, but in the frequency domain. So these are the same images but in different domains, right? And then what we do in our in our solution is that we um, we see that we can compress the these images as well as input maps within neural networks and the filters, for example, in computational layers. And we constrain the frequency bands of conversion operations and remove high frequency coefficients. So this can remove high frequency noise because what we observe is that usually users, if they have this noisy data, have high frequency noise components in these inputs, or for example, many neutral examples, they add high frequency noise, which is difficult, for example, to discern, right? So through this um, uh, band limiting of the, of the inputs and within neural networks, the input maps and, as well as filters, we are able to discard this noise and uh, finally return correct label. So uh, we can generalize to such, uh, for example, noisy examples. And even more, I also did work on analysis of uh, novel NLP uh, models such as transformers. And what we observe is that I found that these transformers improve other distribution robustness. And uh, this can be in, uh, in two cases. One of them is that we want to generalize. For example, if we train or fine tune our pair transformer on some reviews, and uh, here we want this transformer to, for example, give us sentiment of a given uh, review. Is it the review positive or negative? And then we train it on, on reviews, for example, written by experts. Then if we want the model to classify reviews that are written by lay people, not like by experts, then this model is still able to do that. So it generalizes from this like, well written reviews to maybe a bit uh, more um, casual reviews. And then uh, despite not being prepared for such um, different vocabulary, this model can still provide um, uh, correct answers. So we can generalize these uh, unseen examples and still serve users these um, useful answers. Second aspect is that if we train our uh, uh, transformer on, for example, some reviews, and we want this pair to be fine-tuned to classify them as positive or negative, however, we just provide totally different inputs. For example, inputs like captures on images that have no sentiment whatsoever inside them, then this kind of uh, inputs should be rejected because you cannot really assess assess anything about their sentiments. So in this case, we can correctly detect other distribution examples. Okay. So that's uh, about the past. And now let's, let's look into the future. How to create secure and trustworthy machine learning as a service. So we have seen that such ML services are versatile and very useful yet difficult to define. So first aspect is model confidentiality. And here I would like to design more practical attacks against new and real-world APIs to better understand the threat space. And then this can guide us to create more robust defenses. I want to ensure that we can actively defend models currently in the supervised setting while not harming the performance of large demand users. So these active defenses should increase the cost of extraction to disincentivize attackers. And for them, stealing the encoder should be as expensive as running it from scratch. Finally, for the model security, I also would like to ensure that our ownership resolution methods, they work in cases where there's, for example, dispute between companies. And uh, this is about the property of these models. So how should we improve ownership resolution, for example, to uh, get rid of the assumption of the third trusted party, as well as, for example, being able to apply to ownership resolution where there is a real use case, like a court case, and then we can uh, provide these methods to be really robust and uh, correctly resolve ownership for this intellectual property of the models. For data privacy, I want this to be an uh, integral part of collaborative learning. The private data should never leak through uh, shared model parameters, gradients, or other forms of model updates during collaboration. To this end, I would like to build a fully decentralized architecture without a fair trusted party. 
where we can exchange information between collaborating parties using secure multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, and protect data with privacy mechanisms such as PATE. We want to remove any central party that orchestrates the whole protocol and instead rely on a peer-to-peer -peer architecture where any party, any group of peers can act as a server, for example, to aggregate model updates. For the model behind the APIs, we should also train them and train, train these models privately using, for example, uh, the preferred privacy techniques such as the PhD or PATE. So these methods should be further improved to cater to more ML tasks and increase the performance of the models. So, for example, I extended PATE to private multi level classification. It was designed only for single label, but now also can cater to other tasks. And we should extend it further to, for example, segmentation or NLP tasks. So for this NLP uh, tasks, we can, uh, for example, use PATE framework or also the PhD. And uh, mm, finally, what we also want to do is to uh, ensure that our clients who query ML APIs, they can send their queries in encrypted form. Why is that? Because we don't want these parties, if they have some private data, to reveal them to any of the service providers. So here again, we can use tools from cryptography for the inference, such as homomorphic encryption and multi-party computation. And regarding model robustness, if a query ML API differs substantially from training data, then the model should abstain from giving an answer to such a query. We can also take another approach. I show that modern transformers generalize well, and they still can return correct answers even for all the examples. So if the answer is still useful for the user, we should return them. Next, very similar concept is about selective prediction. So here we don't get our distribution examples as inputs. We get in distribution examples, similar distribution as distribution of the training set. However, here our model is not confident about the prediction. So we still want to uh, give answers to the user, but in this case, we abstain from answering such queries and say that we cannot really answer the queries because we are not confident about such prediction. So this is fair because uh, we give to the user indication that the query is too difficult for us. We don't uh, make any mistake for the user. And uh, at the same time, we communicate back that this is the case. And uh, finally, I want the models to be interpretable so that if a given user queries our ML API, which should, and should probably, in some cases, it should be explained why we give a given prediction. So these models can be analyzed from different perspectives, for example, after Fourier transformation, but also other forms of transformation, such as wavelet or discrete cosine transformation. And to recap, my goal is to build ML services that protect model, models from being stolen. They provide uh, privacy protection for our data and expose robust models. So with that, I would like to thank you, also to my collaborators, for the pleasure uh, of working with them on all of these projects. This was really amazing. And also I would like to thank you for the attention. Thank you very much.